Well, we'll be doing now this introduction to what is abiogenesis and how does that differ from evolution because many people don't know, they're confused on this. So, so let's go through that. Well, the reasons for this lecture, just before we get started, this lecture series on abiogenesis, let me just touch on this. Dave Farina posted a, a video entitled Elucidating the Agenda of James Tour, A Defense of Abiogenesis. You can see in the description block, box below for the link. After watching that video, I was confused about almost every slide and statement that Dave Farina presented. It really was. There were numerous gross scientific inaccuracies, not just inaccuracies, not just little things, big, big things in his claims. In my opinion, it's my opinion. Since others might likewise be confused, I'll use the Farina video with timestamps as the launch point for the series of lectures. So you'll see a little number like it might say 10.23. That means at 10 minutes and 23 seconds, that's where that quote came from. Uh, and then, look, I'm thankful for Dave Farina and his attempts to teach the layperson about scientific topics on the, his YouTube channel, Professor Dave Explained. So there's a plug for, for your YouTube channel. That's a commendable endeavor. I therefore seek no contest with Dave Farina, only clarity. I got nothing against him, and I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to teach scientific topics to the masses. This is an important thing to be able to do, and this is something that, that uh, is admirable. All right, other synthetic chemists can comment and point out where I am correct or incorrect. I particularly invite a critique from my synthetic chemist colleagues and students studying synthetic chemistry and those studying origin of life. If disputing, please reference a literature article uh, so that I can read and learn. I just want to read and learn. So if you'd cite that uh, as you're critiquing, that would be helpful. All right, let's get into this. Abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. And uh, this is from Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary. Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. To construct any convincing theory of abiogenesis, we must take into account the condition of the Earth about 4 billion years ago. I'm still quoting. So, so we have to use chemical techniques that might have been available on a prebiotic earth. Nobody was here. There was no biology yet. So this is before biology. This is the chemistry that was needed to assemble life. For a synthesis to be categorized as being prebiotically relevant, it must use chemical reagents and conditions that are presumed to be available upon an early earth or accessible to an early earth. It is not what we can do today. Now, first of all, we've never made life today. We've never made a single cell. We have not. Uh, that's something that, that uh, maybe I'll address in this, and I'm sure I'll address that in this. Nobody's ever made a cell. People have modified cells. People have brought new materials into cells. But nobody's ever made a cell ab initio from the bottom up. Uh, but but uh, uh, we have to use reagents that were accessible on an early Earth. Abiogenesis takes place before biology and before biological evolution can begin. So before evolution can begin, before that first cell can, can, can change into, morph into other, other cells and, and, and start, start reproducing, uh, it has to form. How did that first formation happen? That is before biology. Hence, it's prebiotic or prebiology. That's the difference. Evolution is taking something that has life and, and transforming it. This is before you ever had life. That's what abiogenesis is. All right, what are the characteristics of life? Uh, again, quoting, <clears throat> this is not my, this, the, the, these are, these are uh, 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 published definitions. Quote, responsiveness to the environment, <clears throat> growth and change, ability to reproduce, have a metabolism and breathe, maintain homeostasis, being made of cells, and passing traits onto offspring. Now, homeostasis is a steady internal physical and chemical condition. Uh, cells are, are uh, um, highly in highly non-equilibrium states. They have this internal steady condition. Or some people include cellular organization, 
reproduction, metabolism, homeostasis, heredity, response to stimuli, growth and development, and adaptation through evolution. So some have even added adapt adaptation through evolution. Some origin of life researchers are trying very hard to redefine life to some very, very basic level that doesn't include many of these things, doesn't include a cell. I've seen people say, you, you know, it's, it's not much more than, than, a, uh, than, than a reaction that is autocatalytic. And then if that's the case, a Nobel Prize should be given to Oswald, or he should have gotten one for, for uh, uh, Origin of Life to come up with, with the first, first uh, uh, reaction that was autocatalytic. Autocatalytic means that a reaction makes something, and that something that it's made becomes a catalyst for, for the next structure to be made. And so it, it becomes a template of sorts for another structure to be made. And uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's autocatalysis. Many reactions uh, show this property of autocatalysis. All right, what are the conditions of the early Earth? Nobody was here. Well, there's speculation. Well, there was this article published in December of 2011, so not that long ago. Here, it was published in Nature, which is the top journal, in, top scientific journal. And, and here's the title of the paper, and uh, uh, I'm quoting from, from uh, um, the article and from the news report from the article that was written from the institution where the, this, this paper came out. It says, for decades, scientists believed that the atmosphere of early Earth was highly reduced, meaning that oxygen was greatly limited. Such such oxygen poor conditions would have resulted in an atmosphere filled with noxious methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. To date, there remain widely held theories and, stu and studies of how life on Earth may have been built out of these deadly atmosphere cocktails, out of this dead deadly atmosphere cocktail, unquote. As of 2011, however, it was suggested that, quote, the Earth just 500 million years after its creation was not a methane-filled wasteland as previously supposed, but instead was much closer to the conditions of our current atmosphere. So people used to think that, or many people may still think that, that the Earth was highly reducing, had, had uh, ammonia, which, and, which is a highly reducing uh, environment, and, and uh, hydrogen sulfide, and so so that, that uh, um, there was very little oxygen around. And then <clears throat> it's more recently that people are su suggesting, no, that early Earth was probably more like it is now, uh, closer to the conditions now. We don't know. We don't know. Nobody knows for sure because nobody was there. But I'll give you either. You want a reducing Earth? You want an oxidizing Earth? We'll take either. We'll do chemistry with either. See how far we can get. That, that, that doesn't inhibit me or my, my, uh, my arguments at all. What were the conditions of early Earth? Well, whatever the conditions were, it did not consist of a pristine laboratory. There were no fine chemical producers where one could purchase the starting materials or reagents or buffers. Everything had to be made from very simple organic and inorganic compounds, such as ammonia, methane, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, sulfate, water, formaldehyde, carbonate, formate, uh, cyanide, possibly hydroxide, etc. All, all of these small comments, that's all there was. Now, I don't know any origin of life researcher that really starts out with just these sort of things. Uh, may, maybe Miller and Urey did, uh, uh, but, <clears throat> but very few people start from that point now. Uh, there were no discernible sources of naturally occurring homochiral amino acids to polymerize into proteins no place to buy nucleotides, nowhere to order homochiral sugars, no stores that sell phospholipids, no human-designed coupling agents or protecting groups, no pristine glass vessels, no purified solvents, no degassing steps, no vacuum pumps, no ability to conveniently turn reactions on and off, no simple method to transfer chemicals from one reaction vessel to another, Prebiotic Earth had enormous barriers. So when you say somebody can synthesize a compound today in a modern laboratory, that doesn't mean anything. We're talking about abiogenesis. 
how were those compounds made on an early earth? We have to restrict ourselves to those types of conditions if those reactions that we're doing are going to be what are called prebiotically relevant. Bringing the chemicals to earth from outer space only transfers the mystery. It had to happen somewhere. So if it came from outer space, well, we just extend the chemistry to there. <clears throat> what, how, did the chemi how did that happen? We've got to somehow figure that out. All right, definition of prebiotic from this article on uh, uh, evolution education outreach. Uh, this is what was written as published by James Cleves. James Cleves writes, prebiotic chemistry can be understood to mean various things. Chemistry which occurred before life began or the chemistry which led to life on Earth and possibly on other planets. Workers in the field practically define it as naturally occurring, mainly organic chemistry in planetary or other solar system environments which may have contributed to the origin of life on Earth or elsewhere. The term abiotic chemistry, chemistry which takes place in the absence of biology, and prebiotic chemistry are in some senses synonymous. Since it is generally assumed that the universe is not goal-directed, and since it is not known what processes led to the origin of life, the study of prebiotic chemistry almost certainly includes both productive and non-productive chemical processes. What that means is that there's a lot of stuff that's synthesized that is just trash, that doesn't move on in the direction that we want. And those are impurities that are going to have to be addressed. What are the four classes of macromolecules, large molecules, needed for life? What are the building blocks of those macromolecules? Well, polysaccharides or carbohydrates. Uh, their building blocks are monomeric sugars. <clears throat> These encode information. Sugars are huge encoders of information on the way that they are assembled. And so um, uh, there's actually more information can be stored in sugars than in DNA and RNA. Uh, and, and so you have to have the, the building blocks, polysaccharides, and the building blocks of the building blocks, the monomeric sugars. You have to have the proteins. Their building blocks are amino acids. Enzymes are generally catalysts for synthesis of biological molecules, and they are large proteins. These encode information. Nucleic acids, like DNA and RNA. Their building blocks are a trimer of a nitrogenous base linked to a pentose 5-carbon sugar that's linked to a phosphate. In this trimeric form, it's called a nucleotide. These encode information. Lipids. Their building blocks are fatty acids, glycerol, phosphate, and often ethanolamine. Their fluxional assemblies encode information. Many people don't realize that, but that's what's being shown, that these... These, you have domains of them, and they will swarm. They're not homogeneous, these lipid bilayers, and they swarm depending on, the, on where you are in the action of the cell and in the life of the cell. All of these encode information. There's information encoded in these molecules, just like, or in the, in the lipid case, in the organization of the lipids, just like a barcode on a box encodes information just like the magnetic strip on your credit card encodes information, or like the, the, the silicon chip in your credit card encodes information. All of these encode information. We have to deal with the information encoded in these as well. All right, so there is a car. It's got a lot of parts. How many people could take all of those parts and assemble that car, even with directions? It would be pretty hard. What if you had no directions? Could you do it? Well, maybe some people could if they're nicely laid out like this. If they were all jumbled up, it'd be much harder. And, you know, this isn't even all the parts. Certainly, there's some assembly already here done. But this is just a lot of the parts. Now, what if these weren't all nicely laid out for you? What would you do? It'd be much harder. You had no directions. What if you had no tools to put it together? You, know, you had no shop to do this. You had no vice. You had no... No, no vice grips, you had no screwdriver. I mean, what would happen then? Be even harder. Now, 
What if instead of all in a nice room like that, they were spread out throughout the earth, some in, in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of an ocean, some next to a volcano, some in other pools that dry and refill every day, some in very cold environments, some under the earth, <clears throat> some in the Himalayas, and others at the bottom of the ocean. And that's where you distributed these parts. Then what would you do? You have to find the parts before you could get them back together. That'd make it even harder. Well, some people say, well, a lot of this came from outer space. Okay, let's distribute the parts in outer space. Now all of those got to somehow come together so we can form that car. That's very much like what you have to do with a cell. You got to get all the parts and you got to get them together before they can start functioning. Those are the four basic classes of a cell. Remember, this is not my definition. It's, uh, life has got to have a cell. If you want to redefine life separately, go ahead and do that. But we're talking about cellular life. It's hard. This is what you're up against in abiogenesis. It is a hard problem. Now, the other thing is parts decompose. You know, you leave a part out in the, in, in the desert or by an ocean, these things are going to start decomposing. Uh, plastic parts in a desert aren't going to last long. Metal parts in an ocean aren't going to last long. Do molecules decompose? You bet they do. And if you say, well, there was not an oxidizing environment, like scientists are saying today on an early earth, there was a reducing environment. Okay, <clears throat> tell me what ammonia does to molecules. Tell me that that's a pretty strong reagent toward molecules. Tell me what uh, hydrogen sulfide can do to molecules. So there's always molecular degradation. Molecular degradation is happening all the time. Sure, synthesis can be happening as well as degradation. Molecules don't last long. We'll see lots of examples of that. I will cite papers on that. I won't just make claims. I will cite papers for you. Here's the synthesis problem. Composited. Molecules that compose living systems almost always show homochirality. They have one chirality. We will have a whole, a whole video on homochirality, so I'll explain that to you. Uh, when building molecular systems, constant redesigns are needed, which take the synthesis back to step one. Uh, it's often impossible to remove a moiety once it's been added to a molecule. So if a synthesis is going along, it doesn't know where it's going because the early earth is mindless. And, and it's going along, it, it says it's gone on 100 million years, and uh-oh, it's stuck on the wrong group. How do you go back? A lot of times you can't easily remove a group. Not all reactions are in equilibrium the same in the forward reaction as in the reverse reaction. So, so for someone to claim that they're all reversible with an equilibrium constant of one or something is utterly ridiculous. You can have an equilibrium constant easily of 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh. Molecules don't always go back. Uh, the, the synthetic reactions do not know how to stop their current course of progression or why to stop. There's no targeted goal in, in abiogenesis. Time can actually be the enemy because molecules decompose over time and often quickly under conditions for their formation. You'll see how chemi chemists run reactions. We'll look at the actual prebiotic chemistry that is coming out of groups where the yield goes up and after, say, 24 hours, it's optimized, and then the yield starts dropping down quite quickly. So what does the chemist do? He or she goes in and stops that reaction when it's optimized. How do you tell a prebiotic earth to stop the reaction at that point? Because it doesn't even know what it's trying to make, doesn't know what it's going toward. If you don't fish the reagents out of a reaction, they end up going to a mess. A prebiotic system does not have the ability to easily purify structures. If it doesn't have the ability to purify structures, you've got to deal with all sorts of other products. And those suck up the starting materials. Very hard to bring impure products, highly impure, where your product might be just 1% of what you want and bring that forward to, to the next step and have things going well. Very difficult to do that. Nobody knows how to deal with that problem. A reagent addition order is essential. When you're making a cake, you put the icing on last. You can't just throw the icing in with the milk and the eggs. It doesn't work that way. There is a precise order. You've got to have the same thing in chemistry. When you're building complex molecules, precise order is essential. How that happens on an early earth, you can speculate, but you'd have to speculate that it happened over and over and over again and, and just so precisely so it didn't mess up the chemistry that, you'd, that had already been formed. 
The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light or no light, pH, atmosphere, gases or no gases have to be carefully controlled in order to build complex molecular structures. You see the same thing in the procedures that are done by origin of life researchers themselves. And you'll have to scratch your head and say, how was that done on an early Earth? How did that ever happen? Over and over again. Once, maybe, maybe. But over and over again like that, you say, well, I had a lot of time. Well, I had a lot of time to decompose as well, as we'll see. The characterization at each step is essential for the chemist, but it's hard in a prebiotic system to consider because it knows nothing of molecular structure. It doesn't know how to, how to, to know if it's pure or not. Biology does. Biology has, has, has receptors that, that can detect. And if, if, if these, these molecules are not the right shape, I mean, there's other molecules that come and, and, and break them up. I mean, biology is amazing. But remember, this is all prebiology, chemistry much harder to think about how that was done chemically. The mass transfer problem would be the killer of all roots. How do you start with a little bit of material and then, and then, and then carry that on many steps? You say it happened, you want to start with a kilogram of material? How did that carry on? You want to start with a ton of material? How many, how many steps can you get through? Especially when you don't even know where you're going, you don't know how to optimize on each step. How do you do that? Did it run the whole kilogram or the whole ton of material at once? Okay, and then what happens if you have a 1% yield? What happens if you have a 1% yield? Then, then you, you drop down to, to just 100 kilograms. What happens if you have another 1% yield for the next reaction? Now you've gone from a ton to a kilogram. What happens if you have another 1% yield? Now, now you're, you're, down, you're down to uh, 10 grams. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem. It goes away very, very quickly. Nature keeps no laboratory notebook, so it can't go back and bring through more starting material because it never knows never knows what it had done so even it gets to a certain point it doesn't know how to go back these are big problems these are big synthetic problems that are going to plague origin of life research to think about this most of these have never been addressed by any origin of life researchers why not because they haven't thought about it it's because nobody knows it's hard to address these are smart folks that are working in the area of origin of life. But these are hard problems to address. Origin of life. Molecules don't care about life. Organisms care about life. Chemistry, on the contrary, is utterly indifferent to life. Without a biologically derived entity acting upon them, like a human being, Molecules have never been shown to evolve toward life. Never. They don't evolve toward life. There's no impetus to evolve toward life. Molecules don't move toward life. Biology keeps caring about life. Organisms do. Cells do. But not molecules. Never been known to, to move toward life. So this whole word of taking evolve and putting it into the realm of synthetic chemistry is really a misnomer. These, these things don't try to go toward anything. There's no impetus to go toward anything. So with that, we, we conclude on, this, on, on just giving you this basic background on, on uh, introduction of what is abiogenesis. And so from here, we'll just take it on to the next step, and we'll talk about uh, uh, the primordial soup after this. OK, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. If you want to subscribe, just click right here, subscribe, and we'll give you a shout out when the next video in this series comes out. Thank you.